Hello everyone. Uh, I'm very sorry I can't be with you all tonight uh, and I hope you don't mind me taking uh, advantage of modern technology to to uh, provide a, the, the content for this week's material. Um, the plan is that I will divide this class up into three separate videos which you can watch over the course of the next day or so. And if anyone has any questions, and I know we usually do field questions in class, but that won't be possible here. So you can either send them in the comments or, or indeed just email me the various questions as they occur to you and you can send them on to me. Okay, so we're going to begin with a, a, an overview of, first of all, of international organizations. Tonight's class is divided up into three main sections. We're going to look at uh, the international organizations and uh, uh, and, and how they fit in and how and the different families of organizations. Later on, we're going to look at the system and the, I suppose, the world system that they have uh, evolved into, which is uh, the, the, the period of globalization. And we're going to look specifically at the phenomenon of transnationalism itself. And we're going to finish up then with an examination of a case study, uh, one that I'm pretty familiar with, which, which I hope um, means that what I say will be will be uh, suitable for, for people to maybe think about uh, exploring further if they so wish. And it is a complex phenomenon, which is the European Union, which is an example of how in the modern period, um, organized st states have organized themselves into uh, various uh, regional organizations to try and um, solve problems. And that's really what, uh, if, we, if we move into it, that's really what international organizations are. They did exist before the end of World War II, but it wasn't until after World War II and the emergence of the UN system and the emerging um, uh, integration of economies and the emergence of the Bretton Woods system, where the protectionist regimes of the 1920s and 30s uh, were largely seen as uh, discredited and whereby the states knew and realized and leaderships realized that the only way that uh, nations could prosper was if they traded with one another um, and increasingly uh, the emergence of uh, organizations uh, with with multiple memberships of member states became uh, an increasing norm as it were and it, it is as i say all about problem solving so what we have to consider here first is the theoretical angle uh, of this um, we're familiar with realism uh, where it claims uh, that the world system is essentially anarchical, that it does not have any system of laws or authority above the nation state, and that anything that happens above the nation state is ultimately grounded in uh, the self-interest of, of member states and the pursuit of their own power and policy objectives. Now, defying that, uh, were the emerging lattice work of international organizations from the post-war period onward. And while it was, uh, they emerged, you know, piecemeal in the early stages, they became increasingly specialized and focused. Um, even within the UN family itself, there are a range of organizations that only deal with one real, uh, one major issue at a time. And, and we'll, we'll get into those a little later on. So the question really that we're asking is, are we looking at with the emergence of these international organizations and indeed also with the emergence of transnational organizations and non-governmental or non-political organizations going across borders, are we looking at a liberal revival? Is this the end of anarchy? And we discussed last week in the international law class, for example, about how although international law is weak, uh, and although uh, it's, there are not uh, a very robust system of sanctions in place for states that uh, don't comply with international norms, that actually, for the most part, states are complying with international norms. Uh, and it becomes more egregious now when states don't do so, and, 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 and they are the exception rather than the rule. Because most states, for the most part, particularly in relation to issues like trade and, and and security cooperation uh, are following uh, the international system. So the international organizations can be divided up into um, three essential categories. And I, I've come up with these categories for this class. They are analytical distinctions rather than uh, academic um, certainties as such. And there should be, I should say a word a little bit about the, the, the idea of an international organization, an IO, 
and an intergovernmental organization because you'll be more familiar probably with the IGO um, because it's distinguished then or, or, or contrasted with the INGO because there's intergovernmental organizations and inter uh, international non-governmental organizations. But here I want to concentrate on international organizations because it denotes the concept of states of international uh, cooperation. Uh, and I subdivide these into uh, the intergovernmental, which looks at where member states uh, come together to form uh, some kind of uh, an institution to oversee a particular problem or, or indeed um, a, a sectoral issue. Uh, then, of course, I, I want to divide that again into the functional dimension, the, the functional or sectoral uh, level, where membership is, is there, but it's not really a political issue. It's more a technical uh, issue, um, where there are certain things that happen across boundaries that need to be somehow regulated or, 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 um, or, or controlled or administered in some way. And then there's a curious combination then, the third one, which we'll look at in detail um, in one case towards the end of this uh, class. And that's the regional one, the, the uh, bringing together of nation states in a regional uh, organization because they are closely, uh, they're close together geographically, uh, but also because they have multiple sectoral interests that could be uh, brought together under one roof, as it were. So we'll look at uh, the various ones in, in, in turn. So intergovernmental is usually characterized by large nation state members and weak authority. Um, there is frequently very little oversight beyond uh, a willingness to comply with uh, an agreement or treaty or declaration. They are for the most part pretty reliant on consensus for any kind of an agreed position. Um, if one member state is not keen on a particular policy, then the other states can pursue it, but they can't necessarily do it under the auspices of the intergovernmental organization itself. So there's very much a, an interest in making sure that member states of particular organizations move forward as a full group. Uh, and as we'll see later, there is some divergence from that now in the case of the European Union. Um, but international intergovernmental organizations really don't have a huge amount of uh, a, a huge ability to sanction their members for violating core principles and rules. And that's certainly the case here in ASEAN, for example, because ultimately it, it does come down to the question of to what extent is the state willing to relinquish a certain amount of control over its own policy making. Um, we'll look at the European Union later, but from, for the most part, states are reluctant to relinquish control um, of, of particular policy areas. So some examples of intergovernmental organizations, obviously the United Nations itself, which has become an umbrella uh, organization for a whole range of other, uh, what they call the UN family. Uh, other than that, we have the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is a security organization that was formed after a Helsinki conference in the early 1970s. Then we have the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That is really more or less a, a peer review policy um, organization where it doesn't have any kind of sanctioning power at all, but it does provide information on best practice between member states and it does comparisons. You'll frequently see OECD reports on education or poverty or, or, or whatever. The Interparliamentary Union was an experiment that began in the second half of the 20th century to look at how um, elected representatives of different member states could be brought together. There's the International Organization for Migration, the very important World Trade Organization, which formally came, in, came into existence in the early 1990s because it was formerly known as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And then we have some other groupings then, such as the G7 or G8, depending on who attends, also the G20 and uh, there are international organizations but uh, this one also under the un family but, but pretty important the international atomic en energy agency so looking at the family of un organizations we have the un development program unicef the un high commission for refugees the world food program the united nations uh, office of Dr drugs and crime uh, the population fund uh, the un environment 
uh, formerly known as UNEP, now known as simply as UN Environment. Uh, the Relief Works Agency, which is responsible for delivering aid and assistance to Palestinian refugees. Uh, more recently, following uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, we have uh, uh, UN Women and we have UN Habitat, which looks at the question of uh, homelessness and, and issues around um, uh, environment and urban planning. Within that, of course, as well, is the World Bank. And the World Bank has a number of subgroups within it as well, usually settled or centered on reconstruction and development, uh, settlement of investment disputes, uh, the development association, the, the question of transnational finance uh, and um, multilateral investment guarantee agency. And these groups uh, emerged out of the World Bank because of a specific problems that they were that, that they set out to resolve over the course of the latter part of the 20th century in addition we have the international monetary fund which played a significant role in the recent financial crisis uh, the world health organization which is located in geneva uh, the the education scientific and cultural organization uh, which is uh, 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 regrettably quite underfunded but still uh, important in uh, uh, helping developing economies invest strategically in their education and scientific uh, advancements. The International Labour Organization, which is uh, pretty important in terms of it works closely with issues around migrations uh, because people are moving around in, in order to find work. The Food and Agriculture Organization, the Maritime Organization. And then we have these uh, within the UN system, their own sectoral development as well, um, the telecommunications, postal, intellectual property, and the International Panel on Climate Change. And they become much more focused on dealing with very specific issues within the broader uh, framework of uh, development and, and, and international cooperation. In addition to that, we have a number of organizations uh, that lead uh, the strategic uh, investment in development across various parts of the world. Uh, there are two ADBs. There's the Asian Development Bank and the African Development Bank. Uh, and their function is to uh, allow regional organizations to invest specifically in projects around infrastructure uh, and education and development in order to facilitate economic development. Similarly, Europe has a European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and that dated really from World War II, when Europe had to reconstruct in the aftermath of the Second World War. Similarly, for the Inter-American Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, which uh, works across the, the what's putatively referred to as the Islamic world, which stretches from the Western Mediterranean all the way across to Southeast Asia, like countries like Indonesia and Malaysia and the Nordic Investment Bank, which deals with Scandinavia. Now, towards the end of the Second World War, it was recognized that the protectionist system that had played uh, a significant role in uh, causing considerable economic difficulty for many, many uh, nations prior to the Second World War was simply not going to be able to work anymore. Uh, there was a recognition that resources had to be uh, reallocated across uh, the, the global system because some countries were better endowed with natural resources than others. It inevitably meant that the doctrine of self-sufficiency, which became prominent in the 1930s, was simply not feasible anymore. Uh, and as the war turned uh, and, and the Axis powers uh, headed towards defeat, a number of senior financial and political figures met at Bretton Woods in the United States to hammer out a new trade system. Uh, and the purpose of this new trade system was set to, was to set the rules for financial relations between independent states in the aftermath of uh, the Second World War. Now, that was all fine because currencies were linked with gold. But in August 1971, Lincoln, uh, Nixon sorry, uh, delinks the dollar uh, from gold reserves and the dollar became a, what's known as a fiat currency. Now the Bretton Woods system effectively ended at that point um, and, and from then in combination with things like the oil shock and the emergence of the recession in the 1970s, 
um, the Bretton Woods system, uh, the, the, the agreed upon system sort of came to an end. But, um, but emerging out of this was the concept of functionalism. Uh, and around the same time as Bretton Woods, uh, David Matrani uh, finished his work on the working peace system. And that sought to sketch out an alternative to world governance. There had been talk in the aftermath of, uh, uh, or towards the, the period where Hitler was defeated, that in order to prevent the emergence of another Hitler, another uh, Nazi Germany or imperialist Japan, that some kind of international um, authority needed to be established to keep states in line. The problem there, as, as the realists pointed out, is that no authority could exist unless it had the consensus of, of the nation states themselves. So some kind of a world government was not feasible. However, David Matrani came up with another idea, and that was uh, instead of having a world government, that we would reconfigure political authority into technical domains. Uh, and it would take care of some functional and sectoral cooperation uh, along the lines of mutual interest. Things like, for example, making sure that trains cross borders unimpeded, that the same kind of train system are in operation, that there's the ability to resupply and, and communication systems can work, that there's some kind of common global linkage uh, uh, that, that all states share uh, in, in developing uh, towards. And he made a very specific point in his work when he, he argued against the world government model and, and looked instead in, for the, the functional alternative. Uh, and he makes the point that can these vital objections be met and the needs of peace and social advance be satisfied through some other way of associating the nations for common action? Now, he does point out at this point that in an actual fact, we're already moving in this direction, even as far as early as the 1930s and 40s that the whole trend of modern government indicates such a way. That trend is to organize government along the lines of specific ends and needs, and according to the conditions of their time and space, in lieu of the traditional organization on the basis of a set of constitutional division of jurisdiction and of rights and powers. In national government, the definition of authority and the scope of public action are now in continuous flux and are determined less by constitutional law norms than by practical requirements. The instances are too many and well known to need mentioning. One might note only that while generally the trend has been toward greater centralization of services and therefore of authority, under certain conditions the reverse has also occurred, powers and duties being handed over to regional and other authorities for the better performance of certain communal needs. So what Matrani is talking about here is taking things out of national government hands and placing them in the, into the hands of technical authorities that transcend individual member states. Because states in themselves cannot uh, regulate or, or, or administer things that happen beyond state borders. And yet states are nevertheless connected. And this would be something that would go on uh, to... to, to establish certain sectoral international organizations and these are not actual organizations these are these are the domains that these organizations work in a whole range of organizations for example humanitarian relief organizations uh, rescue organizations the question of the environment of course has become very prominent in recent times because environmental concerns transcend national borders very readily and national governments are simply not in the position to regulate their own environment because of the impact of other environmental factors outside of the state ter territory. In addition to that, things like fisheries, which is to do with the high seas, uh, maritime organizations, which is to do with the transportation uh, and the use of the high seas, questions of arms control, because no individual member state has the, the, the credibility or the authority to, to administer arms control, so that has been outsourced, if you like, to uh, arms control organizations and observers. Energy organizations. Energy can be stored in batteries, but ultimately energy when it is produced must be directed somewhere. And increasingly what, what uh, nations are finding is that sometimes they have a, a deficit of energy production and sometimes they have a surplus. Uh, in addition to that, there's the, uh, the acquisition of energy sources, for example, hydrocarbons or nuclear fuel. Uh, 
and in, that is even diversified now as well into sustainable energy organizations, organizations that oversee, administer, or, or can advise on the production of sustainable energy in certain national contexts. Uh, financial organizations, uh, trade and customs organizations, which oversee the very technical, uh, detailed and uh, voluminous uh, legislation and, and uh, production of trade and customs regulations. In terms of justice uh, into the International Criminal Court and Interpol, the level of cooperation, criminals don't respect national borders, so nation states have to cooperate with one another in order to coordinate their response to criminal organizations and criminal activity. Educational organizations, which is a natural because education sort of transcends boundaries as well. And a whole range of cultural, ethnic and linguistic uh, and religious organizations, Francophone. Uh, there's even an organization to do with Portuguese speaking. We, these are speak, Portuguese speaking countries. These are residues of uh, the colonial period religious organizations such as the organization of Islamic cooperation for example ideological and political groupings like the non-aligned movement the group of 24 etc etc so these groups mainly emerged from the end of world war ii uh, they evolved in response to particular problem solving needs centered on international trade primarily uh, and as i said this was a, a counterweight to the protectionist uh, philosophy that emerged prior to the Second World War. So as multiple problems were identified and threats uh, evolved, more international organizations you know, came into existence. Um, and this is really a classic case of nation states engaging in coalition building and mobilizing their interests uh, so that they can uh, solve problems that they can't solve alone. So. What kind of world system is this uh, all part of? And we have uh, we can we can argue about whether globalization is a cause or a consequence of these kinds of organizations, or whether indeed these organizations emerged as a result of globalization. Uh, but we need to have a look basically at the kind of system that emerged across the globe in the aftermath of the Second World War. The Second World War had resulted in uh, a simultaneous, multifarious, and multifaceted conflict across a range of contexts, uh, both uh, in terms of time and in terms of geographic location, where um, allies and Axis powers coordinated with one another, pursued their own objectives, but ultimately also laid the groundwork for a much more integrated system. In addition to that, warfare itself had brought the world closer together. Uh, the capacity to uh, deliver munitions and, and ordnance to various parts of the world from long distances away, the, the dropping of the atomic bomb, the development of missiles, etc., etc. Uh, the development of, edu uh, of uh, communication systems that sort of facilitated this. All of this had an impact on uh, bringing the world uh, much closer together. So we're going to look at some of the features of the contemporary world system so that we can understand the place of international organizations, transnationalism, and specific organizations like the European Union uh, in that context. So what do we mean by a system? First of all, we have to understand that this system is not necessarily an orderly one. It was not teleologically driven. It was not that someone sat down and, and thought up of what, how to organize or, or, or set up the current world system. It, it emerged organically. Uh, it emerged in a piecemeal fashion. Um, each problem being solved brought new problems and new issues to the fore. They in turn had to be solved. So what we're, we're looking at really is a series of accretions and accidents uh, that, that uh, emerged over the course of time, not necessarily connected. And the attempts to solve these primarily uh, it gave rise to the, the current world system. So I want to look at some signatures of contemporary globalization. You'll probably have heard of these terms, but I want to just place them all together here uh, in, in this one context. The first and foremost is the very dramatic expansion of markets. 
a whole range of trade agreements, both bilateral, regional, or, or multilateral economic arrangements, all the way from bilateral agreements between two, two countries, all the way up to things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, etc., etc., and the establishment of the World Trade Organization itself. Um, and the function of this is to reduce or eliminate trade barriers because countries before this had engaged in what was known as protectionism. In order to uh, purchase certain goods that were uh, manufactured outside of a given territory, the, the consumers within a particular territory had, would have to pay more for that. And the purpose of this was to protect uh, indigenous national industry. So it was making it more expensive to purchase imported goods rather than your own indigenously produced goods. Uh, and a whole range of free trade or, uh, arrangements emerged uh, in, in, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and it was part of what we refer to as the neoliberal paradigm, reducing trade barriers, reducing the, the uh, constraints and the obstacles for major businesses to operate uh, around the world, that they could move factories to different parts of the world and avail of uh, cheaper labor costs, etc., etc. But at the same time, price of goods would come down and the reduction of tariffs and taxes means that consumers would purchase more of these goods and so the cycle of economic growth uh, would continue. So when this happens, of course, uh, when trade starts and people start moving around and goods are produced and imported and exported and, and the high seas and the airways are filled with people who uh, are filled with goods and, and products uh, moving around the globe, capital, money, tends to move around as well. And uh, with the digitization of, of financial exchange, for example, um, and, and which, which was led by the City of London in the mid-1980s, when which was known as the Big Bang, um, the ability of money to move around from, from country to country in order to pay uh, and, and, to, and to spend money uh, increased. Uh, in addition to that, we had uh, a significant migration of peoples as well. Uh, there was a significant movement of people, mainly from the global south up to the, the, the global north. Most people moving from the Global South to Western Europe and, and North America. Um, and of course, those workers were both skilled and unskilled, uh, but both were needed. Uh, Germany, for example, uh, was a net recipient of inward migration of significant number of Turks uh, in the 1960s and 70s because of uh, labor shortages in Germany. Similar situation is now emerging in Japan at the moment. Uh, North America has been a net recipient of immigration even before this period, but it certainly accelerated considerably. Western Europe in particular, particularly since the fall of the Warsaw Pact bloc, uh, uh, the Eastern Bloc, there's been a significant movement of people from Eastern Europe into Western Europe searching for, searching for work. And a particular feature from the late 1980s and early 1990s onwards is the, the ability to move information uh, and, and data around the globe. Um, we take it for granted now with uh, email and social media, but also the, the capacity of documentation and uh, information uh, to, to move around is a significant hallmark of the global period. And in fact, even in things as mundane as news media, for example, um, something happens in one part of the world and it's instantly known about uh, in other parts of the world as well. So technology also, the, the, the reduction in the cost of purchasing technology, for example, laptops and Android devices, etc., etc., uh, and the, 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 the democratization of technology. So we're putting technology into the hands of more and more ordinary people. Um, and the penetration of uh, technology into even developing markets is extensive uh, in the global period. Political rule and governance is pretty contested. Um, we have the establishment of and challenges to the state and its institutions. Many states emerged as a result of protests, particularly from the post-colonial period. 
or for during the post-colonial period and, and up to the present. But even now, having uh, removed colonial uh, administration from many territories, many countries are not happy, many peoples in many countries are not happy with that, and they're pursuing other changes uh, to their own political systems as well. It's given rise, for example, to what they call NRMs uh, or, or NSMs, uh, New Social Movements. Um, these are protest groups organized and arranged around social issues, for example, better wages uh, and discrimination based on um, race, religion uh, or political belief. Um, and these these uh, social movements uh, emerged particularly from the 1960s with the counterculture movement and have inspired one another to pursue uh, better social and political conditions and rights. Bolstered as they are by the top-down uh, leadership on uh, international norms that we saw last week, for example, conventions on civil and political rights, economic rights, rights for women, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a two-way system. We have this top-down crystallization of uh, normative parameters and normative uh, milestones and, and markers, etc. And on the other side, uh, compounded by social media, compounded by an increasing awareness by larger numbers of people about what their rights are and what, 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 how they're being constrained in their own societies, we have the birth of new social movements. So it's all quite connected in that sense. So we have two major features, of course. Transplanetary connectivity, uh, in other words, our ability to move ourselves and information around the globe in, 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 uh, in a speed that was not known before the present. We also have supra-territoriality, so we're even transcending territorial geography. Now, this has been forced upon us in some ways uh, through uh, the consequences of environmental change, uh, environmental uh, disasters, for example, nuclear accidents, etc., etc., like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Um, and also because people are not prepared to stay in one place to pursue their life goals. So we have huge numbers of people moving around as well. Uh, some forced because of their uh, particular political circumstances, for example, uh, as refugees. And others, what you refer to as economic migrants. So what we have really is a shift in the nature of social space. Uh, over over this period of time, where uh, if we look back to the emergence of the of the modern system uh, in the period just before the Enlightenment, the period of exploration and, and discovery, etc., etc., where it would take many months to get from one side of the planet to the other, it was a significant significant undertaking, frequently quite hazardous, frequently unsuccessful. Um, the communication between one part of the world and the other was tenuous. It was mainly through established trade routes, like, for example, the Silk Road and latterly transatlantic trade. But now we have um, a, a, a global system where there is instant communication between ordinary people across social media. And where, while we might uh, argue about the specific price and cost of, of uh, air travel, it is considerably cheaper now than it was uh, even a few decades ago. A few decades ago, it was only really for the very rich who, who could do this, but now most people uh, can move around relatively easily by air. Um, so the nature of social space has changed dramatically. So if we were to look at what transnational transnationalism is, we would say that these are regular interactions across national boundaries when at least one actor is a non-state agent or does not operate on behalf of a national government or an intergovernmental organization. So this is the non-diplomatic, because diplomacy and traditional state-to-state -state relations through dipl diplomatic means we're transnational, of course, obviously. But what we have now is we have increasingly uh, contact between ordinary people across national boundaries. And this, contra this contact can be sustained for example, like tourism, uh, sporting and cultural bodies, uh, school twinning, um, you know, uh, city twinning, those kinds of things constitute uh, direct contact between the citizens of one jurisdiction and another jurisdiction on an ongoing basis.
So if we have to get a little bit philosophical about it, we could look at um, how some thinkers uh, thought about this and going back right back to the, to the early part of the 20th century, even before the Second World War, a very important and somewhat controversial th figure, uh, Martin Heidegger, the German thinker, German philosopher, he looked at uh, the, the, the whole question of the abolition of remoteness and that we as human beings, being used to living in small groups and small communities, are suddenly faced with a number of key changes to our social environment, among these urbanization and all the rest of it. And what he, he reflects on in, in his own philosophy is what he refers to as this abolition of remoteness, where we're confronted by people who are radically different from ourselves. And because of that, we are uh, forced to reckon with our own presumptions, our own prejudices and preconceptions. Okay. Um, Harvey, for example, looked as well at the revolution of objective qualities in space and time. The world is just much smaller. Now, more recently, Emmanuel Castel uh, published his magnum opus, a three part book known as uh, The Network Society. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about his uh, contribution to the debate later on. And Ruggie looks at non-territorial regionalism, where we have what we call ideological regionalism. So we have uh, radical leftists who share a particular point of view, who come from different countries. Or indeed, at the other end of the scale, you would have radical Islamists who would share a particular ideology, but are not necessarily uh, an ethnic group per se. So our task really is to look at the conditions of possibility of the contemporary world system. Um, and it's about really thinking about how the world system has evolved and brought us to the place where we are at the moment. Um, and let's think a little bit about what we mean by terms like, for example, modernization. Uh, what does it live? What does it mean rather to live in the modern era? And why is it different to living in other eras? Uh, and what contributes to this modernization process. We might ask as well whether or not this is even a good thing, given, uh, given that uh, modernization does not necessarily mean a more peaceful society. So let's start with the first one. Let's look at what modernization is. It's a tr contrast from and transition between a traditional agrarian society on the one hand and industrial post-industrial society on the other. Traditional society is organized vertically. Modern society is organized much more horizontally. We might argue about that, of course, given the emergence of the super rich multinational corporations and, and the 1%. But essentially, it, it, there is a difference, nevertheless, in comparison to uh, a, a few centuries ago. So, for example, in traditional societies, we have a central power structure and power radiated outward from the center to uh, other parts of society. In the modern society, we have much more, uh, a, a much higher number of different power centers. Now, the state is obviously still the major one, but there are other ways in which lives are controlled and people are, are conducted and administered. Um, um, so, let's look at the evolution of modernization uh, across this, this defined period of history of the modern period. We're going to look at two dimensions, two, two aspects of this. The first one is the dimension of modernization and what are the consequences of it. Okay, so the first uh, dimension of modernization is uh, centered around the concentration of people in large urban centers, comparatively high concentration of population in cities and the increasingly urban centeredness of the total society. Uh, that's known as urbanization. Uh, huge numbers of people moving into the cities, particularly from the industrial period onward, uh, resulted in people moving off the land, off subsistence farming and seeking work uh, in the major cities of Western Europe. Uh, and coupled with that, a relatively high degree of use of inanimate energy and the widespread circulation of commodities and the growth of service facilities, industrialization, which absorbed a huge number of these people that uh, came from uh, agrarian uh, societies uh, first. 
extensive spatial interaction of members of society and in the increasingly widespread participation of such members in economic and political affairs, proximation. Increasingly, particularly from the 20th century onward, when mobility around the world became much easier for ordinary people, we have large numbers of people living close together, but who come from radically different backgrounds. Um, and this has sometimes led to tensions and conflicts, um, but it is a, a feature of the modern period. Uh, and Ferdinand Tonnes uh, refers to this in his landmark work, uh, Community and Society, where he sort of traces the emergence of human uh, social interaction from the level of community, small village area, to larger societies and the concentration of people in larger and larger groups of people, culminating, of course, in the nation state, but perhaps not culminating completely, as we're seeing now some parts of the world uh, gravitating towards um, regional uh, level uh, of political organization. And the other dimension to this, of course, is the need for people not just to work, but to be working, but to work in, uh, in an industrial society. These people have to be skilled. And so from the mid 19th century onward, quite a number of states started to roll out um, education programs and literacy programs because populations might be useful, but they're much more useful if they can read and write and if they can develop skills and, and, and uh, knowledge bases for uh, the purposes of increasing economic growth. Um, and of course, the growth of science uh, and the orientation of the individual towards a scientific approach. Um, and we refer to this as education and secularization. And the secularization dimension of it is the gradual removal of clergy, clerics, uh, uh, from the bureaucracies of um, the, the medieval state, uh, because they were the only ones who were literate, uh, to, to the increasing numbers of people who were uh, lay people uh, from backgrounds that were not religious necessarily. Um, and of course, the extensive and penetrative network of mass communication, probably the most significant and arguably the most salient of the, of the modern features uh, is the our capacity to communicate uh, in various ways uh, from the first satellite broadcast in the early 1960s all the way through to uh, Skype, uh, uh, Facebook Messenger, etc., etc. Now, Manuel Castells, in his uh, magnum opus, uh, uh, published around 98, I think it was, 97, 98. He published it in three volumes. And he discussed this extensively in his uh, The Rise of the Network Society and the impact that this was going to have on, not so much on technology, but on society itself and our understanding of the social world in which we live in. Uh, and he referred to it as the Network Society. And he calls the network society a society where the key social structures and activities are organized around electronically processed information networks. So it's not just about the networks or social networks, because social networks have been very old forms of social organization. It's about social networks which process and manage information and are using, using microelectronic based technology. So it's a question of speed and transferability. And this is starting to have a dramatic impact. Quite a few of you would have done, uh, you, you all in this class would have done uh, a literature review of the impact of the Arab Spring. And it's clear also from that, that social media and information technology played a significant role in the emergence of protest groups in various societies across the Maghreb and the Levant uh, some years ago. Another point to bear in mind, of course, is Benedict Anderson's uh, concept of the imagined community. And, and he refers to the imagined community as that community that exists uh, as uh, that's based on mass communication. Uh, the national identity is less to do with uh, the emergence of uh, modernization generally, as opposed to the specific emergence of mass communication. And he, what he had in mind specifically within the context of the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries and the, the consolidation of the nation state, uh, was the idea of the national newspaper. 
where uh, a, a newspaper that's produced on a daily basis and distributed across the entire territory of a nation uh, and read by increasingly literate populations, uh, which essentially establishes a national narrative, a national self-understanding. And his work was extremely influential and it was probably the most significant book that he ever published was this concept of imagined communities. Um, and it's something that can be transferable now, of course, to the information age, not just the just the, the mass uh, the mass newspaper age. The other dimension of this, of course, is the whole issue of bureaucratization, the existence of large scale social institutions such as government, business, industry, and the bureaucratic organization of such uh, institutions. And of course, Max Weber was the person who looked at how society had become much more bureaucratized and he was writing just under 100 years ago about the increasing bureaucratization of the state where there is a, a lack of uh, the human touch as it were as regards the interaction between the state and its people it has become bureaucratized and it's become uh, uh, about filling out forms etc etc uh, and kafka himself of course who's pictured there would would uh, reckon on that uh, and, and and explore the, the in fictional form the implications of bureaucratization on ordinary people. The consolidation of the nation state is arguably the most important dimension to uh, understanding the international system and modernization. Large bodies of territory becoming unified under one control and the increasing interaction of these units of territory, which we refer to as international relations. Um, it's fair to say that 1648 was important from the point of view of crystallizing the fundamental principle at the heart of the nation state and its uh, the conjunction of its ethno-nationalist or ethno-religious or even ethno-linguistic dimension uh, along with the other dimension of the state itself and the bureaucracy and all of that. But what's also important to remember is that although that happened in 1648 and it was sort of crystallized then, the consolidation of the nation state took a much longer period of time. And it closely follows, as you'll, as you'll read when you go through the likes of Ernest Gellner and Benedict Anderson and other scholars of nationalism, that it is increasingly uh, because of modernization and because of industrialization specifically, that the nation state becomes consolidated. Because now there's a national effort um, and, and it's grounded ultimately in uh, the industrial revolution and the industrial period. And of course, hand in hand with that is the development of the scientific method and the abandonment, the abandonment uh, of both speculative science and we would argue also superstition to a certain extent, that while people would have remained superstitious, superstitious uh, and they would have had certain beliefs and practices, etc., etc., but the state itself was now increasingly founded on rational and scientific um, uh, a basis. Uh, and increasingly, even in terms of today, up until the present, now policies are not made unless there is a significant input from the scientific community because policy has to be what's referred to as informed policy. It can't simply be, uh, it, it could uh, animate or uh, emanate rather from uh, a particular whim of a particular political leader. But ultimately, if, if it's going to be uh, successful in getting through the legislature, if it's going to be successful in getting uh, becoming established, it usually has to be tested uh, scientifically. And they don't always get it right, of course. Um, but nevertheless, there is that credibility issue that if a policy is not uh, based on some kind of academic um, rigor, it's, if it doesn't have a, a fundamental academic basis to it, then uh, it, it, it lacks the credibility to go forward as a, as, as, as a solid or sound policy. So of course, we we're familiar with the scientific method and how that emerged throughout the, the, uh, the, the modern period. Um, but and of course it infuses academia as well but increasingly the main components there are also things that we do ourselves or we should do whenever we're trying to evaluate information because it's part now of, of modern culture 
<clears throat> sort of some other features of uh, modernity. Uh, for example, the expansion of personal choice uh, and, and the concepts of freedom and, and uh, individualism. Now, clashes quite considerably with traditional views of the world, but increasingly what you're finding is a fusion between both tradition and individual freedom. People are choosing, for example, to wear certain things because it's their culture and because they want to do it, as opposed to being uh, having it imposed upon them by the state or by um, some kind of authority. Uh, and individual freedom is becoming a, a, a increasingly important dimension, for example, in understanding things like the Arab Spring. Now, whether or not they're successful in entrenching those ideas and concepts is another issue, but certainly they're sufficient to animate um, the, the, the protest movements that have arisen from them. And in addition to that, there is rapid social change. Uh, with the democratization of technology, the emergence of new ideas, the exchange of ideas, um, we're finding that societies are changing, and not necessarily for the better, but certainly they're changing. And the pace of change is what has increased dramatically in the last, in the last uh, few decades in particular. So in addition to that, we're seeing uh, a secularization as well. Um, within uh, international relations, there is an emerging subfield, if you like, of the role of religion or faith in, in international relations. And increasingly, states are beginning to step back from certain uh, <clears throat> positions that they would have taken before. We've seen a significant increase in the number of uh, Western countries in particular who uh, now have embodied some kind of of uh, legal basis for same-sex unions in particular. Um, and that's because that there are an increasing number of beliefs uh, and, an, and, and a much wider definition of pluralism. Uh, the definition of the family is, is changing and the state is less likely now, particularly in, in the West in particular, although there are obvious reactions to that in other parts of the world. Um, but there is a reluctance on the part of the state to, to continue to intrude on these kinds of personal choices. Um, and of course, it goes back to the issue of approximation as well, that people are now living very close together who have very, very different uh, perceptions of what the good life is. And that can, can cause its own tension. <clears throat> Some other concepts as well is the, the, the division of labor. This emerged from uh, uh, Emil Durkheim in the 1890s, his initial study. Uh, looked at how roles were becoming much more specialized, that the industrial period itself had meant that the skilled artisan or craftsman of the ages past was now being superseded by an industrialized process where each individual is only part of one part of the production process. And that part may not even necessarily be a skilled part because it may only require you to do a certain thing at a certain point in the production process. Um, because the mechanization of production has meant that skills per se are, are, are not as important now as the means of production itself and the emergence of capitalism and the ability to uh, capitalize on cheaper production costs versus high value end products. There are also things like future orientation, uh, consciousness of time, uh, the, the idea of time speeding up and, and uh, people being closer than, than merely uh, geography would allow. So let's look at some of the consequences of modernization. Uh, in a lot of ways, even though we're living uh, in large urban centers, that there's huge concentrations of populations um, and that different beliefs and practices and lifestyles are, are living in close proximity. We're also seeing a fragmentation of social reality as well. We're seeing what we might refer to as the balkanization of the social fabric, where people are starting to uh, peel off into separate groups uh, and clusters where people will only talk to certain people with certain beliefs and practices because they can do it now. Um, people only watch certain news channels they are, and this falls into the concept of confirmation bias where increasingly we don't really have a national debate. We have multiple national debates um, and people are not prepared to listen to the other side because uh, they, they don't perceive them as having a valid point of view. And we saw that most recently in two major uh, instances in, 
in the Western context, which was the election of uh, Donald Trump and the vote for Brexit in the UK. Um, another consequence, of course, is, is much more mobility uh, among populations across geographic space. Europe is, is, under, uh, is, is confronting a major migrant crisis at the moment, uh, where huge numbers of people are fleeing both war and poverty from uh, the Middle East to Sub-Saharan Africa and moving across the Mediterranean uh, to the point where European states have had to instigate a massive uh, operation in the Mediterranean to try and intercept people who are coming across, not alone just to, 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 to try and curb the flow, but also in, indeed to protect the people themselves as the, they tend to be overloaded onto boats and quite a few of them uh, sink and lives are lost. Uh, and added into this, of course, in terms of technology, etc., etc., is the mobility of ideas. And suddenly people are confronted, people from various traditional backgrounds are confronted with um, the, the, the challenge that their worldview may not be the right one, that their worldview may not be the best one, that there may be other points of view uh, that uh, reflect entirely different perspectives but are seen, are, are tangibly more successful. Um, than, than they are used to themselves. And this is bringing about a certain amount of social, political and cultural instability. Um, traditional political uh, allegiances are being challenged. Traditional parties are not doing as well. Radical parties are on the, are on the upswing. Uh, there is dislocation. There is a sense of what we might refer to as social anime, where people feel lost. People feel that uh, they're voices are not heard, that the social and political process doesn't include them and that they're not benefiting from society in the way that others are. Um, and, and another dimension to that, of course, is aspiration theory, which was uh, developed by Kurt Lewin, a psychologist in the United States in the 1940s. And he referred to the idea that people may be content with their lot until they see someone else who's doing better than they are. And then suddenly, what they aspire to, what they've thought was, what what they've thought of as uh, a sufficient and adequate life, is suddenly not anymore because there is something better, there is something different. And obviously, in the age of social media, where uh, the, the latest celebrity uh, picture, you know, captures a thousand words, um, and and people look and see that their lives are different to the lives of other people around. And we also suffer a little bit from our urbanization in the sense that we can, you know, be detached from our environment. Um, famously, Jamie Oliver, who is a, a chef in the UK, um, tried to get children to identify what certain vegetables were, and the children didn't know because they'd only ever seen them chopped up or pre-packed, and they didn't know what they looked like uh, in, in their original form uh, as coming out of the ground, as it were. So at this point, I'm going to break uh, and, and move on to the, the second phase where we're going to look at the implications of all of this, because it may have seen a little bit detached and that we started talking about international organizations, and the various manifestations of uh, how interstate cooperation can occur. And then, of course, transnationalism, but it, it's feeding into this broader social trajectory that we are seeing at the moment about um, the increasing interdependence of nation states upon one another uh, and, and all of that. And we're going to look now at a, at a, at a significant case study of that uh, in the form of the European Union. So we'll break here for now and, uh, and we'll come back in part two.